Hello, anatomy. Welcome to the muscular system lecture. So when we think muscles, uh, so we already started identifying muscles in lab. Uh, a lot of times when people think muscles, they just think of bodybuilders. Uh, and bodybuilders are good ways to identify a lot of the muscles you can see externally. Like here's an, an over work trapezius, here's the pi, the sorry, the pectorals, the biceps brachii, you can see are uh, here, here, yep, okay, and they're called, so this is the deltoid on both cases, um, and you can, they're called the biceps because they have two heads, if you look at the Latin word, it breaks down into two heads, the triceps on the underside, which you can't see, uh, see here, have three heads, imagine that, um, uh, but there's way more to the um, skeletal system than just bodybuilding. And in fact, anytime someone says, I don't have any muscles, you should say, well, then you would be dead. Because if you don't have a muscular system, there you lose a lot of functionality that we just take for granted. So the muscular system not only is involved in movement, uh, but it holds our body erect. So it's actually really complicated to sit straight up or to stand straight up. And it's the fact that we uh, have our trunk muscles, what they mostly do, what our trunk muscles mostly do, um, even if you don't have any very obvious abs, what they do is they hold you upright. And that's um, an important thing. Uh, if you think about how babies have to learn how to hold themselves up and how to move around in certain ways, a lot of that is just training those muscles. Um, our smooth muscles do uh, a lot of non-voluntary motion, so they do this on their own. They move fluids around, like urine and blood. Um, they are involved in peristalsis, which is the movement of stuff through tubes, which happens in the esophagus and in our um, intestinal system. These are uh, basically, it's like having... Um, it's like have, it's like when you have toothpaste and you're squeezing the last of your toothpaste out of the tube. That's like peristalsis, just squishing things through tubes. Um, a very important thing is we've already seen in the integument system lecture is the regulation of temperature. So one of the things that our muscular system does is it will cause us to shiver when we're cold. It also, we have tiny um, arterial sphincters. And a sphincter is just a circular muscle system. It's so it looks like the obvious one that you giggle about when you're in elementary school is the anal sphincter. But our pupils are sphincters. We have sphincters all along the digestive system to make sure stuff is moving in the right direction. If you get heartburn, it's because your pyloric sphincter um, has opened up and let uh, digestive juices into your esophagus. So we have a whole lot of sphincters, sphincters all over our body, including inner arteries, which will allow blood to go into them. Um, if you are too hot, you'll open up arterial um, sphincters in your skin so that you get more blood moving to your skin so the heat can dissipate. If you're too cold um, and you're starting to get frostbite, what happens is those arterial sphincters start closing um, more and more so that your blood stays in your core instead of going out to your skin so you lose heat. Uh, and that's how, if that happens for too long, skin can, or um, tissue can die, and then you can start losing fingers and stuff like that. Uh, so the muscular system is really complicated. It does so many things, uh, whereas our skeletal system is a nice reservoir for calcium and phosphate, and it helps us to be upright and things like this. The muscular system, uh, it, basically the skeletal system, it, a lot of times it's just to anchor the muscular system so that we have places for it to sit so that we can do things like flex, like in this case. Um, so the muscular system really only does, each muscle really only does one thing, it contracts and it lets go. So this kid right now is showing flexion, um, and so he is flexing his bicep. He, in order to do extension, so this arm then goes down, he would have to release the bicep, and then um, the tricep underneath would have to extend. So one muscle cannot push, all it does is pull. And so the muscle contracts and it pulls, and then it lets go to allow another muscle. Either it lets go to allow um, it's just a system to go back to its normal state, or it lets go so that another muscle can take over and do the opposite motion, like extension in this case. So let's kind of go on. There's three types of muscle tissue. We've talked a little bit about these when we talked about tissue. Um, we have the uh, skeletal muscle, the smooth muscle, and the cardiac. So skeletal muscle are, um, let's see. <laughs> so the, we're really going to focus on skeletal muscles in this lecture. Um, as you go into more anatomy and physiology classes, you'll talk more about the smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle. The big difference is skeletal muscle is completely voluntary. So most of the, for mostly... Um, there are reflexes involved that it kind of um, straddles the line a little bit between voluntary and involuntary. Uh, but skeletal muscles are striated, and because they are voluntary, that means they have to be attached to a neuron so that your brain can tell it to do something. Um, I mean, 
smooth muscles are attached to neurons too, but it's a different um, kind of nervous system situation, so we won't worry about it. And cardiac muscles, because the heart is such an important muscle, um, it has to um, be, it's, it's basically just a special class of muscle cells, and it's kind of a combination of both the skeletal and the smooth muscle situation, but it's happening specifically in the heart. Okay, so uh, muscles only pull. The antagonists have to relax when agonists contract. So an antagonist versus an agonist is a pair of muscles. And so, um, and it switches, it depends on what's happening. So when you're flexing, you have your bicep will be the agonist. Okay, so it's doing a thing. And so in order to flex, the antagonist, the tricep in this case, has to relax. But then when you extend, when you're push, pulling your arm out, the opposite has to happen. The bicep becomes the antagonist and it has to relax in order for the tricep to contract. They can't both contract at the same time. Um, I mean, it can in disease states, and we'll see that's what happens in tetanus. But they, uh, in order for the voluntary action that you want to have happen to happen, they have to work in uh, coordination. They can't both happen at the same time. So let's kind of take a look at what's happening in the muscle itself. Muscles, because they have to do so much, they take, it's actually, it's hard to be a functional organism that is as big as we are. Like, we don't seem very big, but if you consider that most of the um, biota on the planet, most of the living things on the planet are microscopic, um, it's actually... Um, Sorry, there's, okay, there's there's a lot going on here. So we're really big. We have to deal with a lot of gravity in order to move around, even if it seems easy. So our muscles have to have layers upon layers of added uh, structure, which is what you see if you open up a skeletal muscle. So this is the femur. Here's a nice big femoral head. So we're looking at a quad um, muscle here, a nice big thigh muscle. But most of our, mus our skeletal muscles are going to look similar. So I like to think of this like a bag of oranges. You're starting with a bag of oranges, and then you're peeling away layers, like you take an orange out of the bag, and then you peel off the outside of the orange, and then you peel the sections, and then you finally get down to the pulp where the actual orange juice is. And so in this case of the muscle system, uh, you start with the muscle as an organ. So each individual muscle we consider an organ. You then, uh, when you open up the organ, you see this very these bundles, and these bundles are called fascicles. A lot of times people call them muscle fibers because they don't know any better. The fiber is actually, once you open up a fascicle, you have these really long fibers. Okay, so the muscle fibers are kind of like, um, they're kind of, I like to think of them like if you've ever looked at um, Wi-Fi wires or cable wires, they're these really long, intense wires that just move uh, information from one point to another in a really fast motion, which is what you have to do in a muscle. Um, wait, so you have a muscle which contains fascicles, which contains fibers, which contains myofibrils, which contains filaments. So the muscle is the actual cell, the muscle cell itself. And so once you get into the muscle cell, the fiber, you start looking at these long pathways within it called myofibrils. Uh, and then we can look at some cell anatomy that we've already kind of covered a little bit. And then once you get into the myofibrils, each one contains a whole lot of filaments, and this is where the action happens in the muscle. This is where the contraction happens. And so we think of just the muscle contracting, but in order for that to happen, you actually have to go down several layers to where the filament actually contracts, and we're going to look at that. Um, this can be a little complicated, so definitely uh, take some notes. Okay. Okay, so what... What's happening? So if you think about the, okay, so there's a lot of words going on here, so let's take it one by one. So the there's something called the epimyosin, which surrounds the muscle. So if you're eating a chicken wing or something, this is the skin, okay? It's not actually chicken skin. It is called the epimyosin. Uh, the skin has to be removed if you're going to eat um, a chicken or any kind of meat. Okay, so they, that's the epimyosin, which surrounds the muscle as a whole. The perimyosin, then, is going to be what is, um, uh, so you open up a muscle, you see these bundles all together. Each one of those bundles is surrounded by the perimyosin, and so the perimyosin contains the fascicle, okay? Uh, within each fascicle, you have the fibers. The fibers are surrounded by the endomyosin. So if you know any romantic languages, and I don't mean sexy, but I mean uh, ones that are based in Roman, Latin, um, you like French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc., you'll see. So we have epi, which means on top, peri, which means within, and then endo, that means inside. So if you're wondering, how do I remember these layers, the epimyosin 
uh, is on the outermost layer. The perimyosin is within that. And then within each of those fascicles, we have the fibers, which are surrounded by endomyosin. So that's important. Um, the important it's important to know the layers, okay? Uh, the perimyosin, so the epimyosin just kind of keeps each muscle specific. So when you're identifying muscles, like when we're looking here and we say, here's a muscle, within underneath the skin layers, underneath the integument system, um, the way the muscles are bunched together originally that we actually see happens because of the epimyosin. The paramyosin within that surrounds the fascicle has the blood vessels and the nerves, so very important. And then the endomyosin, which is surrounding the individual cells themselves, contains stem cells. And we've talked a lot about stem cells already when we talked about the um, stem cells within the bones, with stem cells within the skin layers. Uh, stem cells are just cells, and in this case, they're pluripotents. They can't just become anything. They have to be a kind, become a kind of muscle cell. So they, they're on a pathway already, but they can become any kind of muscle cell that the cell the, the uh, tissue needs. Um, um, ba -ba -ba. So that's important. The endomyosin contains the muscle fibers, the paramyosin contains the nerves and the uh, blood vessels, the epimyosin just surrounds each individual muscle as a whole so, you can, um, so they can be separated by function. Uh, what's a muscle fascia? These are strong layers of dense regular connective tissue that contain, uh, surround one or more muscles, separating them into compartments. So if you think about, again, if we go back to these guys, the, the fascia um, are going to, let's actually get a good picture of a fascia so we can, this is how I record the lectures, fascia, so we can get a good idea of what a muscle fascia is, depending, that is not the same. Okay. So if you've ever been to the body work system, um, which is, uh, okay, so the fascia there, if you've ever done a dissection, the fascia is just connective tissue that uh, is containing all the muscles. You might see stuff like this where it's like, oh, I have cellulite because I have, um, uh, no, we, cellulite is just where we have attachment places. Everyone has cellulite. It's not a big deal. Um, uh, but fascia is what creates the marbling in meat. And so uh, a lot of times people say, look at the marbling in this steak. Uh, what that is, is just connective tissue that's connecting the muscles together or separating it into certain parts. So this is not the same as the epi, or sorry, the endomyosin. Nope, I was right the first time, the epimyosin. You'll have fascia um, that are just separating out complete muscle parts. Okay, so the epimyosin will be underneath containing the muscle as a whole. So I, this may be a surprise, but when you are eating um, meat, you are eating muscle tissue. So that's um, what's happening there. If you've ever read the story of Hansel and Gretel and they talk about fattening up the kids, what, you don't eat fat. I mean, we could, but it's better to eat muscle. And so you'd think really she'd want them to do. You don't fatten up. Okay, ugh, this is getting weird. But uh, in those old fairy tales when they talk about witches fattening up kids, really they should be working them out so they get a better meal. Okay, I made it weird. Let's go back. Uh, here we go. All right, so what else? So fascia are just these big connective tissues, like the aponeuroses are a kind of fascia, the ones that connect the frontal uh, muscle, which moves your eyebrows, that actually connects it way back to the occipital muscle at the very back of our brain. That's the anchoring point. So really, when you move your eyebrows, you're also, it's the back of your, it's not only the front part of your um your front, your frontal muscle that does it, but your occipital muscle way at the back of the head where it's connected. Okay, so the fascia also come together to create tendons, and tendons, remember, are what connect muscles to bones. So like if you need um, a, a distinction between tendons and ligaments, uh, whenever you talk about the Achilles tendon or Achilles heel, that is the ligament that comes, extends off of the epimyosin uh, to create um, a connective surface between the muscle and a bone. And so bones are anchor, they're anchor points for muscles. That's really important. Um, and so that happens through this connective tissue that's coming off, okay? Uh, so if you don't have, I think one of your lab questions is, is what happens if you don't have this Achilles tendon or if it gets cut? Well, then you have no anchoring points for the, um, uh, the gastrocnemius back here. And all of a sudden, uh, you can't move your, there, there's no motion of the foot here. You can't do your extension or flexion of the foot because this muscle no longer exists, uh, or it's no longer connected. 
this muscle actually attaches with very, uh, there's a lot of tension force here. So if you cut this, the muscle actually kind of snaps and kind of curls up a little bit. So it's kind of a, it's a dodgy, um, I mean, it's easy now, but when I was in high school and before that, it was kind of a trickier kind of surgery. So we were told in the 90s, um, if you're, you know, watch out, girls, if you're going to your car in the middle of the night, you might have, you gotta watch out, there might be people hiding under your car waiting to cut your Achilles tendon. It's like, okay, that really, I seriously doubt that ever happened. That's kind of a ridiculous urban legend, but it is a bad idea to cut your Achilles tendon. Uh, the reason why the it's called the Achilles tendon or the Achilles heel is because if you think, uh, if you've ever read the any of the Trojan War stories, um, the Achilles is a hero and he is in, uh, invulnerable. He's completely immortal. He has one of his, his mother, I think his mom is Aphrodite or something, um, and she goes to make sure, or maybe Athena, I don't know. Uh, she goes to uh, make him immortal but she has to hold him in a river and the only way to do that is to hold him by his uh, ankles and so that's the only part of him that isn't immortal and so when they he gets hurt they cut him here and that's what kills him so that's kind of that's obviously a myth but uh, if you do get cut in your Achilles tendon you can't walk anymore so it's definitely a concern you don't want to uh, have that happen but I don't think we need to worry about people hiding under our cars waiting to uh, cut our Achilles tendon that's just ridiculous. Okay, rant's over. Let's look a little bit closer at striations. So, ooh, cat action. Uh, the Okay, so we can identify skeletal muscle versus cardiac or um, smooth muscle because skeletal muscle has these striations. And so smooth muscle doesn't have these striations. Um, they have a different system. We're not going to worry about it. Remember that smooth muscle basically just lines our, our guts and they do a lot of... Um, motion of fluids and stuff happening in our guts. Um, let's see, so if we take it a little bit closer, so we have uh, looked inside our muscle fibers, so let's go back and look a little bit. So, hang on. 